Welcome, sons and daughters of God, on this Sunday of the baptism of our Lord. It is good that we can be together today. We are recording this service on the day after the tragic events in our nation's capital. And like many of you, my heart breaks. I struggle to decide what I wanted and needed to say but I have found that I have no words of my own at this point. And so I would like to share with you the wisdom of church historian and author Diana Butler Bass, who offered this reflection on her blog today. Wednesday was the Feast of the Epiphany, a Christian celebration of the revelation of light, of love, of Jesus for and in the world. Much we've not wanted to see has been revealed today. Ours has been a sad epiphany. The story that Christians read for epiphany is from the Gospel of Matthew. It is a story of a beautiful revelation, a star leading those longing for peace to the birthplace of Jesus. And it is a story of imperial treachery. You know how the story goes. The Magi go to Herod asking for the birthplace of the Messiah whose star had brought them. Herod is troubled by their question and their news, and he begins a deception to try to get rid of the new king. And the Magi are told not to trust Herod, and so they go another way on their way back home. I share this tonight because at the very beginning of the Christian story, we are warned that the birth of peace and justice is intertwined with the reality of imperial violence. As the beloved community comes into the world Evil kings will lie and murder, do anything to stop the possibility of God's dream made manifest here and now. So what do we do? Be like the Magi and do not give in to Herod. The best wisdom I have tonight is that the wise men were indeed wise this is the time to pause amid the yelling and remember the light of the star. Remember the angelic song of peace. Remember the longing of our hearts for a governance of grace. And remembering, we continue on following the star. It will stop. We can kneel, worship, be overcome with joy. Even though Herod lies, God's presence does not absent itself. Love is still here. And then, once we let that truth fill us, we do not go home the way we came. Because there will always be some Herod whose fear leads to violence and death. We will have this epiphany by another road. I don't know where that other road will take us, but we can't continue on the road we've been traveling. If nothing else, I'm glad we're on this journey together. And so am I. There are many who will see more clearly today than yesterday, and many who will be searching for the star. Look up. Salvation is at hand. Let us pray. Eternal God, amid all the turmoil and changes of the world, your love is steadfast and your strength never fails. In this time of danger and trouble, be to us a sure guardian and rock of defense. Guide the leaders of our nation with your wisdom. Comfort those in distress. And grant us courage 
and hope to face the future. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to prepare yourself for worship. Make ready your worship space with a candle. Light it as a reminder of the presence of God's Spirit with us. And we will be celebrating communion as part of our worship today. So if you plan to share communion, I invite you to go ahead and get your bread and cup as in preparation for that celebration. Now, Mark Hellman, our music director, will introduce to us some new parts of our service as we begin together. During this season of Epiphany, we're going to be learning some new liturgy. And this week, we're going to introduce two sections of it. The first one is Glory to God. And this is the song that the angels sang at Jesus' birth. And the way this piece goes is, I will sing the first part of the refrain, and then you will sing it along with me the second time through. I will sing the verses, and then we'll sing the refrain a total of three times over the course of the song. The second piece we're going to be learning is the Alleluia verse that comes right before the gospel. And this is an echo piece of music. I will sing the first line and you simply repeat it back to me. And in this way, we create a warm welcome for the reading of the gospel. As we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, we're reminded that in our Lutheran tradition, baptism becomes the point at which we join together with Christ and with his church. And so we gather together around the font this day to celebrate God's mercy and grace. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God.
Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. Oh, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Glory to God in the highest and peace to us. pray together. Holy, Holy God, God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading comes from Genesis chapter 1. Out of chaos, God brings the order. Out of the formless void, God brings light. This familiar story was good news for the Israelites who experienced much chaos in their history. It remains good news for us. God created and continues to create new life. A reading from Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The second reading comes from Acts chapter 19. In Ephesus, Paul encounters people who have received John's baptism of repentance, but has never heard of the Holy Spirit or of baptism in the name of Jesus. After Paul baptizes them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and empowers them with the gifts of the Spirit. A reading from Acts. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not ever heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into them who were you baptized? They answered, In John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongue and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Oh, uh -huh. 
The Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Since you are watching this at home, it may not, may not be too obvious to you, but we have made some decoration changes here. And we've done it because the season of Christmas is over, and now our tradition has us moving into the season of Epiphany. The word Epiphany means a celebration of the revelation of light, of love, of Jesus coming into the world. This year we are focusing on the Gospel of Mark. And Mark's way of telling this story, in his version, everything begins by the riverside. He doesn't have a lot of buildup. He just jumps in telling us the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Boom. That's it. No manger, no shepherds, no angel choir, no magi, no word of God present in the creation. There's none of that backstory that we so much long and love to celebrate. Nothing that would help us know who Jesus is until he has grown up, until he's ready to start his ministry in Galilee. But you know, it's really hard for us who know this story so well to get all of that backstory out of our mind. We pour so much time and effort and energy into what Luke and Matthew and John tell us about Jesus' beginning. But think about this. We make Jesus coming into the world sound like it's the greatest news that ever came to the earth. And it is. And yet, at least according to Mark, for what we believe is around 30 years, Jesus' presence in the world barely created a ripple. The only prelude we have to the adult Jesus is John the Baptist. Today we hear again that there was a a, a lot of curiosity and a lot of interest about John. Tradition teaches that John was the first prophetic voice to be heard in Israel in almost 400 years. And that got people stirred up. We hear that they were coming from all over to be baptized as a sign of repentance. 
Another way of saying that is that the beginning of the good news is a call to tell the truth. The first part of God breaking into human life through Jesus is a call for people to be straight with themselves and with one another. We hear that they were confessing their sins, confessing their inability to live as God intended them to live. And so John's washing was a sign that they were ready for repentance. A word that means to change one's mind, to change one's direction, to change one's outlook on life, to move in a new way, to give up one kind of living and trade it for another. Mark tells us that the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is telling the truth. Dr. Fred Craddock, a renowned preaching professor, once said, what's frightening about listening to John preach is that it puts you in the presence of God. And that's what everybody wants. And that's what everybody doesn't want. Because the light at the altar is different from every other light in the world. In the dim lamps of this world, we can compare ourselves with each other and all of us come out looking pretty good. We convince ourselves that God grades on a curve. And what's the difference? We're all okay. And then you come in the presence of God and you're at the altar and it's all different. There's no way to modulate the human voice to make a whine acceptable. The whining is over. The excusing is over. It's the church. It's the school. It's the board. It's the government. No, it's not. All of that is over. It just stops. And that's the truth with God. John is telling them and us that repentance is the truth about who we are. Is there anything that could be better for us as we begin 2021? Coming off a year that seemed like hell for so many reasons. We long for good news. We want so badly to feel whole. To feel alive again. To feel if, that goodness is alive in the world. But we can't just wish for it to be so. We can't just go out to Costco and get that. We can't pretend. We have to tell the truth about who we are and what is real and what we need to be made whole. How we are burdened by our sin, really burdened by sin. How we live in distrust of one another and even of God. How we've allowed systems to bind us to ways of living that exploit others and creation. There are so many ways we are out of step with God by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And dear friends, the reason that is the beginning of the good news, is that it makes us stop whining, stop making excuses. And it opens us up to the rest of the story, which is where we find the best news of all. It's where we find Jesus. That's what the story tells us. 
It says that while John was busy dunking folks in the muddy waters of the Jordan as a sign that they were ready for God to come, Jesus is right there in the middle of them. I love what Pastor Philip Martin says about that. He says, Jesus moves along right there among all the ordinary folks, all those who've had some trouble with the law, all those who've made bad mistakes with their lives, all those who have let God down in so many ways. There's Jesus, shuffling along in the crowd, making his way to the riverbank, looking like one of us. And although Mark and John tell us clearly that he's not just like one of us, that he is the beloved Son of God, by telling us this story of Jesus' baptism and making it the beginning of Jesus' life, Mark is trying to get across a very important lesson. That Jesus comes to be immersed in our human existence. Let me say that again. Jesus comes to be immersed in our humanity. Yes, the heavens open. Yes, the Holy Spirit descends. Yes, God's voice says, You are my Son. With you I am well pleased. And so God does anoint Jesus as His Son. And yet, God has Jesus live as a man, as a human being. And so Jesus' mission will be carried out as one of us. Someone who knows all the trials and disappointments of life. Jesus will teach and heal and bless as someone living out God's kingdom amidst all the bad news that this world can offer. Because Mark's story begins with Jesus' baptism, Mark is telling us that Jesus comes to stand with us in all the brokenness of life. But he's also telling us the truth that because Jesus shares our life, our living can also be blessed and holy and redeemed. The truth that Jesus comes to be human means that God created Him to be the human we need to be. And because of His life, death, and resurrection, we stand with Him again. The truth of this story is that as we are immersed in the waters of our baptism, we are claimed as God's beloved daughters and sons, immersed in the grace and forgiveness and love that God pours out across the world. And when we hear that good news, when we trust that good news, life begins to move closer and closer to how God intends it to be lived as one of God's beloved. I was reminded about this at Bible and Biscuit on Thursday as we talked about what does it mean to be beloved, to be loved. And I remember a favorite story. Maybe you've heard me tell it before. It's a story about Fayette, a member of Hobson United Methodist Church in Nashville. Pastor Janet Wolf says that Hobson is a wildly diverse congregation filled with those of us who are crazy and those who think they're not. Years ago, Fayette came to Hobson. Homeless, she lived with mental illness and lupus, and one day she showed up for the new member class. In a conversation about baptism, as Pastor Wolf would say, a holy moment when we are named by God's grace and with such power that it won't come undone. That whole idea captured 
Fayette's imagination. Pastor Wolf would say how Fayette would, during the class, would ask again and again, and when I am baptized, I'm... And the whole class began to respond together. You are beloved, precious child of God, and beautiful to behold. And Fayette would would respond, oh yes! And then we'd go on with our service and our lesson. The day of Fayette's baptism came. She wanted to be immersed, and so she was. And when she went down under the water, she came up sputtering and cried, and she said, and now I am, and the whole congregation sang out, beloved, precious child of God, and beautiful to behold. And she said, yes, and got up and danced around the sanctuary. Two months later, Pastor Wolf got a call. Fayette had been beaten and raped. It was at the county hospital. Pastor Wolf writes, So I went. I could see her from a distance, pacing back and forth. And when I got to the door, I heard her say, I am beloved. She turned and saw me and said, I am beloved, precious child of God, and then she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror, hair sticking up all over, blood and tears streaking her face, dress torn and dirty. And she started again. I am beloved, precious child of God, and she paused, looked in the mirror again, and declared, and God is still working on me, and if you come back tomorrow, I will be so beautiful, I'll take your breath away. The truth that Mark is telling us is that life can be broken and battered and dirty and sinful. But Jesus, the beloved child of God with whom God is pleased, comes to stand with us in the midst of it all. And because he does, we too are beloved, children of God, blessed, forgiven, redeemed. May the waters of our baptism cling to us so that we may know the truth about who we really are. And in the days to come, from our depths, may we be an epiphany to reveal to others what their true name is. Beloved. Precious. Child of God and beautiful to behold. In Jesus' name. Amen. The prayers of the people. On this Sunday of the baptism of our Lord, Let us offer our prayers for all in need, responding to each petition with words from today's psalm. Give us your blessings of peace. For the worldwide church, for those who minister in the church, for all who will be baptized this year, and for their godparents and sponsors, that the Holy Spirit will empower all the faithful for lives of service. Let us pray. O God, give strength to your people. Give Give us your your blessings blessings of of peace. peace. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for international efforts to prevent war and reduce violence, for the armed forces, for police officers, and for peacemakers, 
that God inspire all people to work for the harmonious well-being of others. Let us pray. O oh God, give strength to your people. Give us your blessings of peace. For students, for teachers, and school administrators, for parents assisting their children in homeschooling, and for young people who are finding a way towards graduation, that the academic year resumes. God, give resilience to everyone in the search for education. Let us pray. O oh God, give strength to your people. Give us, give us your, your blessings, blessings of peace. peace. For all who are in trouble, want, or sickness, for the countless who are suffering with COVID-19, for medical workers, for people who are hungry or homeless, imprisoned or lonely, and for those we name here, Susan Bayman, Jesse Brock, Larry Crawford, Linda Dusseth, Sam Green, Alberta Holden, Mary Lou Schofield, Roger Strong, Bob Stroud, Matt Surick, Bill Sutton, Ron Wagner, and those in our hearts or on our lips. That God grant health and wholeness to a world so filled with pain, let us pray. O oh God, give strength to your people. Give us, give us your, your blessings, blessings of peace. peace. For ourselves, that we rejoice in your adoption of members of God's family. And now in this silence, we bring to God our heart's request. Let us pray. O oh God, give strength to your people. Give us your blessings of peace. Almighty and most merciful God, you are the mighty voice from heaven. You are our beloved Savior. You are the descending dove. We give you thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies. And we ask you to accept our prayers for the sake of your mercy today and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Friends, this time of Epiphany worship is different for all of us. Usually we would be gathering together here in the warmth of our sanctuary. But even yet, Christ is present with us as we share in this meal. I invite you to prepare your bread and cup for this gift of life and light. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for them to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ, comes to us humbly through this bread and cup, uniting us together as brothers and sisters. And so we are bold when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, here is bread. Here is the cup. Here is Jesus. Come and be fed. I invite you to share the bread and cup with all who wish to commune in your gathering or by yourself if you are alone. Please eat and drink with these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you do not wish to commune, please offer and receive this blessing. God loves you very much, and you are God's son, God's daughter. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. Again, we welcome you to this time of worship and we thank you for allowing us to come into your home as we worship together today. As we are beginning the season of Epiphany, they, we think back to an ancient tradition. Uh, it's called marking the home. It's an opportunity to be reminded of Christ in our midst as he begins his ministry in the world. And so back in the ancient day, they would take a piece of something like charcoal and mark on their doorpost something that would signify the year and also the blessing. And so this year we would take a piece of chalk and mark on our doorpost the number 20 plus C, the letter C, plus M, plus B, plus 21. Obviously the numbers 2021 signify the year. But the initials CMB represent the first initial or first letter of the traditional Magi, Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar. But it also stands for the Latin words Christus Mansionem Benedictat, which means may Christ bless our home. So we 
invite you to uh, do this tradition as part of your epiphany observance. Take a piece of chalk and write those uh, figures over your doorpost as a prayer to ask Christ to be with you and to bless your home in the coming year. And now may we offer this prayer for your house. God who is three, God who is one, give blessing to this house. Bless it from roof to floor, from wall to wall, from end to end. May your spirit dwell within these walls to bring joy and laughter to all who enter here. We call upon you to save, to shield, and surround this home. Bring light for the day and rest for the night. The circle of God around it, the peace of Christ within it, the life of the Spirit above it, to bless it with peace, joy, and love, so that all who enter here, guest and host, will be welcome and safe. Amen. And now hear this assurance of grace. God has always loved you. God loves you now, and God will love you forever. This is the good news that comes to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so may we go about our days trusting that God will continue to bless us and keep us, that God's face will shine on us with grace and mercy, that God will look upon us with favor and will give us peace. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.